Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Futureverse, brought to you by Intelligence Squared and Ytree. I'm Harriet Johnston, and today we're delving into the psychology of money and the different ways we can move beyond our learned behaviors to create lives of financial freedom, or at least some sort of financial peace of mind. At Ytree, our mission is to help our clients build lives in which wealth is defined by how they live, not what they own. And that means we're as interested in what our clients want from their lives as we are the numbers on their balance sheet. So to talk this through, I'm joined by two very experienced guests when it comes to relationships and money and the relationship between the two. Lucy Beresford is a psychotherapist, broadcaster, writer, and former investment banker. For four years, she hosted a sex and relationships phone-in show on which she was dubbed the Naughty Mary Poppins. And she is currently the host of the podcast On the Couch, which looks at politics through the lens of psychology. Robin Powell began his career as a journalist and founded a media production company. He now focuses exclusively on financial content and is the founding editor of The Evidence-Based Investor, a blog that works to dispel the myths surrounding investing and challenges the vested interests of the asset management industry. Lucy, you worked in investment banking for 10 years before retraining as a psychotherapist. So what inspired that transition? <laughs> uh, quite a lot of pain, I think. Quite a lot of uh dissatisfaction. And, and that is not to rubbish my 10 incredible years in investment banking, because I really did have a tremendous time, made friends for life, and uh, one of whom is coming uh, for lunch today. So, that, that shows you that it's a, it was a very solid and healthy part of my life in many ways, but it wasn't completely fulfilling. And it's one of my missions in life when I'm working clinically with people is to really help people find their voice, really. And I think I lost my voice in investment banking. I lost uh, a very big part of who I am and and, and what makes me feel fulfilled. And, but it took a long time. It took going into therapy to make that shift. And once I'd gone into therapy, I remember thinking, yeah, there is something missing and I need to dig a bit deeper on this. So, uh, I stepped away from the investment banking life and all of the amazing travel and all the amazing people, but I gained so much more in terms of how my life changed and, and the purpose that I have now in life, which is great. And, and do you think there was anything specifically about the psychology of money that put you off or had you change or maybe the lack of conversation around the psychology of money, even though obviously in investment banking, it's kind of the focus, right? Well, it, it, funnily enough, it ought not to be the focus because it's a, it's a relational uh, industry. It, it is about money and it's about the flow of income and it's about hopefully amplifying that within the capitalist system. But it is also relationship banking. And what I observed and what I was clearly much better at than gazing at spreadsheets, which I literally probably even now couldn't do, was I was very good at building relationships. And I was very good at at networking and, and pulling people together, bringing people together. And in fact, I, I pivoted away during investment banking away from the purely transactional uh, of you know m a and and IPOs to actually augment and amplify the relationships that the bank had and that the clients had with themselves and I suppose what I noticed was that if you did that if you if you stepped away purely from the the figures the numbers the zeros at the end of the balance sheet and you dug deeper into the psychology of the people who were making the widgets or um, you know, creating the, the the wealth that actually the companies thrived in a very different way, and that was maybe without realizing it, my first foray into the psychology of money that it's that it's so much more than the the actual cash. It, it's about our attachment to it, and it's about our relationship to issues around scarcity and emotional supplies, and and that really is is what quite a lot of my work is is today. Robin, in your book, you describe a wake-up call you had about investing while making an online documentary. What was your realization? What mistakes had you previously been making? Well, I'd been a, 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 
just a general television news journalist for 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 many years. I had no specialist expertise in in finance or investing, but I'd always been really quite interested in it. And I would read the Sunday Times money section, and uh, uh, I'd read books, uh, and I'd really kind of take an interest in in the stock market and shares and so on, but. Um, you know, they say uh, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and it certainly was in my case because uh, w- whatever I seem to do, uh, you know, w- whatever shares or funds or asset classes I, I bought into, they, they all tended to uh, to flop, um, and I seem to be doing all the right things, following the advice of you know people who appear to be experts and so on, and then. Um, when I set up my own production company about 12 years ago, uh, our first client was a wealth management firm who were very much into um, index funds and passive investing. And I was very skeptical about this. Um, uh, and uh, I said, right, okay, I'll do it. But I must say, you know, I, I'm not sure about this kind of passive investing business. So I, I went to the US and interviewed some very key people, Jack Bogle, the founder of, uh, of Vanguard, which is a, um, a very successful wealth management firm, asset management firm out there. Um, I spoke to a couple of Nobel Prize winning economists, uh, Eugene Farmer uh, and, and William Sharp, and, and some really key people in, in the financial industry. And what amazed me, uh, uh, Harry, was was how much information there is out there on how to invest. And yet, not only do most of us do almost the complete opposite of what we should be doing, we, we're actively encouraged by many financial professionals, including sadly many financial advisors, to do the wrong things. Um, and yeah, I, well, I'll perhaps talk in a moment about uh, how people should be investing. But but yeah, I, I learned that I, <laughs> whatever I'd learned in the past was was not doing me any favours. So, Robin, what are those, those simple rules of investing that it's possible to distill your book and your philosophy down to? Where, where have you landed in the end? Well, there, there, there are six key um, uh, messages, uh, rules, if you like, that that we um, that we uh, give to readers in in the book. And and the first one, it, it's, it's, it should be obvious, but actually, a lot of us make this mistake. We 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 pile in and we we buy things, maybe act on um, tips in the newspaper and so on. Whereas we really should be starting with a purpose. You know, work out. Why are we investing in the first place? You know, and then to have a plan, a broader financial plan, and then have a method. So that's the first rule. The second thing is just take a slice of everyone's business. Don't worry about which shares or which funds you should be buying. Just buy the whole thing. You know, don't look for the needle, just buy the haystack. And you can do that so easily now. With a with a broadly diversified global uh, equity index fund, um, to dilute your risk because you know investing inevitably involves risk. You basically add lots of time. Um, you you say right, I am not trying to make money in the short term. I am investing for the next. 20, 30, 40, maybe my, my kids will be investing probably for the next 60 years. And that's a long time. And when you're in it for that kind of length of time, your ch- the chances of something going badly wrong are significantly uh, diminished. Um, the next thing is, we call it phone a friend. Um, but to be honest, a financial advisor uh, is is... Uh, the, the best kind of friend, I suppose, financially that you, you, you can have, but somebody whose opinion you, you trust and, and co- contact them when you're worried about the markets or your portfolio, because lots of people do irrational things with their money. They, they get very excited and they buy lots of things or they get very worried and they sell everything. That's not a good idea. So phone a friend. The fifth one, only focus on what you can control. You know, we 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 make this mistake all the time as investors, but there are actually very very few things that we do control. Cost is actually one of them, so focus on those. And finally, keep investments simple 
cheap and automated. Simple, cheap and automated. That's the way to go. Very good. So those are some pretty um, concrete uh, ideas about what we can do. But but Lucy, what are the key factors to consider when we're coming at money and finances from a psychological perspective? Because we know we're just not logical beings. You know, we can hear these great. These are the six simple steps we need to follow. But but what happens from a psychological perspective? Well, my argument would be that actually the, the psychology is the more logical bit, but that's because you need to understand your relationship to money and your relationship for risk, for example, or your fear of loss. And that's so logical when you understand what people have gone through. So perhaps somebody grew up in quite straightened circumstances and they've got, you know, fantastic opportunities for wealth now, but deep inside, there's still that five-year-old child that remembers something quite significant, like having clothes handed down to them or conversations that they could pick up when they were younger around parents talking about money and finances. And children don't necessarily understand everything they're hearing, but they can for sure pick up the tenor of the environment. And therefore, one's childhood experiences will really, really colour how you feel, even as a grown-up, even when your circumstances as a grown-up are radically different to what they might have been uh, in the early days. So, I think it's crucially important to understand why you have the views about money that you do. Do you, do you always think that something will turn up? Or do you always imagine that you will always have a lack? And you can change that. You know, the mind is an incredibly powerful thing. Mindset is everything in life. And if you go through life thinking, oh, everything's going to be bad, it's all going to go wrong, I'm going to be left destitute, well, that's probably what's going to manifest in your life because you're going to go into the world with that uh, sort of aura around you, putting out that energy. And you can change that. You can definitely be the kind of person that makes your own luck, that attracts abundance, that attracts things happening that, that really build on themselves and, and amplify to a positive degree. But you have to know yourself really well to make good choices for yourself in life, whatever that is, whether that's romantically, whether that's about your career, or whether it's about for your finances, you have to know yourself well enough. So Robin's key rules are fantastic. And there I am scribbling them down. But I also know that some of them will bump up against my very real fears that you know are things that I work on to process. And I'm sure all your listeners will have similar things. But it's like, yeah, I, I know what my head should be telling me, uh, but my heart is saying something slightly different. And that's why I loved it when Robin said, you know, phone a friend. Uh, because talking about these things whether it's to someone trained in a professional capacity like me, or whether it's, uh, as you say, Robin, someone that you trust, someone whose advice you think is sound, uh, that's all, all really important. But again, those people are also bringing their own psychology to things. Uh, they're bringing their own life experiences. So always temper the conversations that you have with people, no matter how much you love them and trust them, with your own experiences, your own gut feel about what is really important and healthy for you, uh, because you only have one life and it's down to the choices that you make that are the most important thing. They, and other people can't live your life for you. Ultimately, you then have to be the one that makes that decision. Yeah. So we, we've gone right to the, to the heart of the matter there. Robin, you write in the book about the complicated feelings that can be attached to managing money um, be it guilt, worry, blind panic. Um, what would your advice be to someone struggling with those feelings? Well, I mean, Lucy's quite right. I mean, behavior um, plays a hugely important part in, in investing. There's this whole new uh, academic discipline called behavioral finance, which has uh, grown up over the last uh, over the last sort of 20 years or so. Uh, and it's really, really fascinating. And I would encourage people who you know, want to find out more about it to 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 read it because it's 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 well, a it's fascinating, but also it's really useful, and you can apply it to your own life. Um, I think what I would really encourage people to do 
is to actually go back to basics and work out that the relationship between uh, m- money and and what a, a sort of happy, contented, fulfilled life looks like. Um, money is only a, a means to an end. Um, you know, it, it's not an end in itself. And um, a really important starting point is to work out, you know, what is important to you? Um, for me, money is all about helping us to live authentic lives. I was interested to hear Lucy talk about her experiences as, as an investment banker. She, she felt that, um, you know, she, she wasn't, in a sense, living her, her sort of true life, if you like. And I went through exactly the same as a, as a, as a TV reporter um, about sort of 15 years ago, and that um, made me make some important life changes. But that's a really important thing that people need to, 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 to think about. Um, the evidence is actually quite mixed on whether money can buy happiness. Um, it, it, to, to an extent, it can. And there's research that shows if you spend money on certain things, for example, getting people to do chores that you don't like, whether that's sort of cleaning or, or whatever, that, that is cleaning your house, that that is actually a, a good way to spend money. Spending on experiences generally brings us more happiness than, than stuff. But ultimately, you know, money is not the be all and end all. Financial well-being is just one contributor to overall well-being. You know, it, it, it needs um, to be put in its place. It's important, but it's not all important. Although I would just have one thing to say to that. I, I agree with absolutely everything Robin has said. And there is a and at the same time, a complicating factor, certainly in Freudian terms, in the sense that Freud would argue that financial supplies represent emotional supplies, which is why people do get very hung up on the external validation of how much am I earning, how much am I worth, how big is my bank balance, how big is my car, how big is my handbag, that actually we can get caught up in the idea that ah, if, I, if I'm worth this much financially, then this means I'm worth this much uh, as a person. And again, that does have its roots in childhood, and it often has its roots in terms of um, family dynamics, who's got more pocket money, uh, who inherits more. You know, the, 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 the dramas in families of the idea that, you know, you have two children, but, the, but when the parents die, the will isn't divided equally is just, there are so many examples where human relationships are being played out beyond the grave as uh, in terms of monetary supplies. And therefore, sometimes it is it, when you're reflecting on Robin's brilliant six points of things to think about investing, I think it's worth paying attention to, okay, how do, how do I see money? What, what does it symbolize for me? Does it symbolize uh, my value, which of course is, is actually an error, a false, a false uh, belief really, or is it about, yeah, opportunity? What, what can I do with this? Do I want to give it all away? Do I want to go bungee jumping in off Victoria Falls, or you know, do I? What what does that money enable me to have? Does it is it freedom? Is it uh, lack of anxiety? Uh, that sense that I can give it to other people. Uh, so ju- again, what is my relationship to money? Because as Robin said, it isn't actually the money bit that's the most important bit. It's actually how we view it and what our relationship to it that really counts. Robin, you've also talked a lot about the costs associated with sort of active investing, the unlikeliness of investment managers to outperform the markets over time. And this is something that we're, we're, we're always talking to our clients about at, at Ytree. Um, in your experience, why are people often so, so blind to the costs associated with their investments over time? Well, I, I absolutely agree with 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 Whitery that that the the evidence is just completely overwhelming. Not just the academic evidence, but um, the regular data produced by the likes of S and P Dow Jones Indices and Morningstar. 
it consistently shows that the vast majority of active fund managers fail to outperform the market on a properly cost and risk adjusted basis over the long run. And the academic consensus is that somewhere around 1%, that's just a very, very tiny proportion of things actually do outperform, genuinely outperform in the long term. And the key is, how are you going to find those uh, um, outperformers in advance? We can all see who they've been with their, in the past with the benefit of hindsight, but who, who are the winners going to be in the future? Nobody knows. Um, the one thing that we can control, and I talked earlier about the importance of focusing on what you can control. The one thing you can control is cost. Um, and you've got to see investments like, as, as being unlike any other purchase we make, if you think about a house or a car or a holiday, generally speaking, the more we pay, the better it is, the better the product or service we receive. In investing, it's, it's completely the opposite way around. You know, the less we pay in fees and charges to have our money managed, if you like, the more we keep for ourselves and the better our uh, eventual outcomes are likely to be. Why does this happen? Well, I mean, it, 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 Lucy probably be able to tell you better than I can. But it's it, it's down to various behavioural biases we have. It's it's um, it's down to, for example, FOMO. You know, uh, uh, fear of missing out uh, on on you know a star fund manager who you know whose performance looks great today, but. You know, we've seen so many of these managers, haven't we? Neil Woodford, classic example, but there have been many, many others. You know, today's hero is tomorrow's zero. Um, but the media and the active fund industry, they know just the right buttons to press to make us invest with these expensive funds. And it's a really bad idea. Lucy, do you have anything that comes to mind when, when we're having that conversation? Yeah, it's absolutely right. There's, there is so much research, whether it's, you know, blind tasting wines. You think it's a really amazing wine because you've been told that the bottle is super expensive. But in fact, in terms of your palate, you probably prefer the supermarket one just as much if it was done in a blind tasting. Uh, that Again, it goes back to that idea of if it's expensive, it must be better. That if it's cost more in financial terms, that it must be a better whatever it is. And, and you see this in dating. You know, the research shows that men on dating apps lie about their height and about their worth, their financial worth, how much they earn or how much their bank balance is. Um, whereas actually for women, it's their age and their weight. But that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> uh, but if you have... If that is literally what's still happening in 2023 in the dating world, it just speaks to how alert our antennae is to issues around financial value. And if we could just strip that away and think so much more about not just the costs, but also the relationship, you know, what am I getting in terms of advice? What am I getting in terms of value added, feeling that this financial advisor is on my side, supporting me through this you know, journey of, of financial growth. Those are going to be way more valuable in the long term than, than just pure costs. We've been doing some research at Ytree specifically around property and mortgages, actually. And I, I've got some specific questions for both of you. But just to kick us off, Robin, What's your assessment of the health of the property market currently here in the UK? Well, as uh, well, what I call an evidence-based investor, one of the key um, uh, no-nos of evidence-based investing is making market predictions. Uh, I, I, I don't make market predictions. And look, I've been wrong on the property market for about the last 30 years. <laughs> uh, you know, I was expecting uh, a, a fall. Uh, a, a significant fall in, in in prices by now. It just hasn't happened. Why? I think it's largely down to supply reasons, a lack of supply. Um, and of course, that might change if, if say, a new government comes in and, and possibly builds lots more houses. That, that, that might change. It wouldn't surprise me. 
to see prices come down substantially or to see the kind of situation that's happened in Japan where, where, where prices were just um, steady for, for, for decades. Um, uh, what, what I would just say to people about houses is, do they actually need more than one house? Um, you know, it, it, you are already quite exposed to uh, the risk of the housing market just by owning your own home. So if you own, say, two, three or 10 homes, then you are magnifying that risk. And yes, it has worked over the last sort of 20 years or so. But will it work over the next 20 years? I don't know. The other thing is, do you need such a big house? You know, um, you know, it doesn't seem long ago that my, my wife and I were having conversations about moving to a bigger house. But now we've reached an age where actually this is more than sufficient for what we want. Uh, that's another really key thing. The, the only other thing I would say is remember the hassle factor in buying a house. Um, if you buy an index fund or a, a, a low cost index portfolio, you know, they're not going to phone you up on a Saturday night to tell you that the boiler's packed up. Um, you know, it's it's simple. It's a simple investment that's not going to cause you lots of hassle. Um, we underestimate the costs involved in maintaining a house, but also the the emotional costs and the time costs. L Lucy, do you think it's even possible to be analytical um, in this way when it comes to something as emotionally charged as home ownership? Well, I think you do have to be analytical. I mean, the Office for National Statistics announced today that house prices have fallen by by le by only 0.1 percent, and that's despite all of the mortgage rate increases that occurred in the summer. Uh, which I, I think Robin's right. I think it's basically down to housing s stock, you know, and the lack of uh, supply. But your home is where you live, so it isn't just about. And this is actually a slightly peculiar British thing because there are lots of countries in the world where home ownership doesn't have the same allure. But certainly in a country like uh, Britain, it's very much about having an asset in addition to it being about where you live. And there is a lot made of house prices because there is that there has been that expectation over the last 20 to 30 years, maybe longer, which is that you will buy at X, but you will be able to sell at Y. And that doesn't always happen in other countries around the world. There's just an expectation, I buy at X, I don't pay any rent, uh, and, and then maybe I have it as an asset to, to give to my kids. But it, it's just it's somewhere where I live. Whereas in Britain, it's, it's, it has been combined with this idea of something that will make you a ton of money at the end of it. Um, at, although obviously any of the, us who are old enough to remember the days of negative equity would, would remind you that that doesn't, you know, what can, what can go up can also go down. But I think certainly in terms of your attachment to your home, it, and, and this is why I, I think a lot of people look at people who buy other properties to do them up and sell them very quickly are often quite curious because for many of us, you you buy your home and you just don't want to leave it. It's it's it has all of your emotional longings and your experiences, and that's a very beautiful part of your life. And why would you want to willingly give that up? So I think the idea that you can treat it just as a commodity is is quite hard because for many people it's. As Robin hinted, you know, it's where you raise your children. It's where maybe you were carried over the threshold by your spouse, where you had incredible experiences. Maybe you did up the garden. Maybe you decorated. It's, it's got so much of us in that. It, it becomes almost like an extension of the family. People are very used to the idea that your pet is an extension of your family. But I often feel that your home is is part of that. It, it represents that container of safety that you've created for yourself. And when Robin says, you know, it's quite emotional to to let go of a house, to sell a house, I think that's right. That's why ultimately it can be so difficult uh, when you come to downsize because you just don't want to let that part of your current life or your past go. I think also it, because interest rates have been low for some time, I suppose the temp the tendency has been for 
people, especially first time buyers, to take the most amount of debt that they possibly could and therefore, you know, get the, the biggest mortgage. And I guess now with interest rates changing, perhaps our attitude to debt and our attitude to, to home ownership will, will change again too. I think that's in inevitable, uh, Harriet. Um, I, I, I mean, I certainly hope it happens. Um, I mean, I, I think you have to distinguish between good debt and bad debt. And, and, and there are, there are types of debt that are better than others in, and, and are effectively good debts. Um, you know, um, investing in education is, 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 is really important. Yes. Uh, going to college is fiendishly expensive, but it, but actually that is an example of a of a good debt to have. Generally speaking, it's not for everyone, uh, uh, but but it, it is the right decision for 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 many people. Um, having a mortgage generally is a good debt a good debt to have. It, you know, we 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 get as as Lucy says benefits. Uh, uh, over and above the financial, uh, the, from 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 owning a home, um, you know, and, and maybe, you know, this era of higher interest rates will make us sort of start to see houses as as homes rather than rather than the investments that 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 uh, that they become. Um, but um, yeah, let let's stop um, uh, giving in to this um, constant. Uh, Advertising, which gets us to to buy now and pay later, um, you know, I was watching an excellent Martin Lewis um, program the, the 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 other day, and, and and him saying how, you know, that is just a really really bad habit to get into. Um, if you can clear your credit card every month, and if you can just resist. Buying something if you can't actually pay for it now, generally speaking, that will, you know, stand you in very, very good stead financially for the future. I, I want to conclude by asking you both about relationships and money, as so much of our work at Ytree is focused on trying to get the whole family around the table uh, when it comes to conversations about wealth. So, Robin, how do you recommend couples approach their investments from a practical perspective? Well. Talk, you know, talk, talk about money, and, and and not just about investing. Uh, uh, you know, what do you want to achieve? Basically, have honest, open conversations. And by the way, <laughs> especially before you get married, um, uh, 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 but ongoing. Um, you know, share those responsibilities. You know, in so many couples, it's the man who makes the investment decisions. That is a bad idea. You know, uh, it has been shown that although women are generally more cautious than men, and often they tend to uh, put too much money in cash and not enough money in shares, they're not as prone to overconfidence and overtrading as men are. And actually, um, the, the the evidence shows that that women actually do achieve slightly better returns than men as a result. So 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 involve the. the you know both parties, if you like, in that in that conversation. Lucy, for couples managing investments together, do you have any advice for how to navigate potential conflicts that could arise? I don't know differences in risk tolerance, as Robin alluded to there, or, or potentially even the goals. Well, I, I think Rob is absolutely right. It is about communication and conversations, but that would obviously also include listening. You have to listen to your partner to hear what their appetite for risk is or to hear what their fears are. Because, uh, and well, uh, I don't know whether you're going to bleep this out, but you know, there is quite, there is that difference between the genders in a very sort of heteronormative way. You know, you've got the willy waving of the men and you've got a slightly more interior perspective from the women. And, and therefore sometimes that can actually be the complementarity of that can work really beautifully as it would, you know, during sex that actually, you know, the men to come together. So you can, if you can have a great conversation together and say, well, maybe you take a little bit of extra risk in that um, part of the portfolio, but I'm going to be a little bit more risk averse in this one. But together, our overall risk profile will be, you know, whatever it is, 70 or 80%, then that would be better. I think 
this might be too late for some people listening to this podcast, but yeah, have those conversations before you finalize your union. Because what some of us do with, with our clients is we get them to draw up a value list. You know, what, what are your top 10 values? And then you ask your partner to do what are their top 10 values? And obviously, ideally your, your 10 values match their 10 values that you both think that fidelity is really important and that, uh, you know, sense of humor is really important and attitude to money and risk is, is the same. But if you find that your, um, need for fidelity or, or attitude to risk in money is up here, number 10, but for them, it's not right down here at the bottom, then that's going to tell you something about uh, future issues for navigation going forward. Uh, but in all seriousness, I think it is just about having those ongoing conversations. Because again, if you're I was doing some uh, research recently for um, for Ashley Madison, the married dating website people, and we were looking at the fact that you know people could live to 120 quite soon, and if you're going to be having a shared relationship with someone from the age of let's say 30 or 35, everything around your life will change, and that includes your attitude to money. That includes what your needs will be. Your needs in your 30s around money are very, very different. And, and Whitery are brilliant at kind of uh, flexing this when they're talking to their clients. Okay, what's your life and your demands in your 30s and your 40s? But actually, hang on, what's it going to be like in your 70s? When you're 90, are you going to have to pivot to think more about you know, live in healthcare or funding for, for a care home, then you, you would never really have to think about that in, in your 30s, uh, hopefully. So, even that demands that your conversations with your partner need to be ongoing uh, for the rest of your life, but, but also make it fun because money, money doesn't have to be about anxiety and concern. It, it can be about playfulness and and the joy that it brings your life. And as Robin said so early on in, in this conversation, it's about the potential. What, what kind of life does it enable you to lead? And that's, you only have one life. So make sure you squeeze the most out of it. Well, that's a wonderful way to, to end. So Robin, Lucy, thank you so much. And if any of the issues we've discussed in today's episode piqued your interest, please visit y-tree.com to find out more about Ytree and the work we're doing to provide an alternative perspective on money and life. And if you liked what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode and feel free to explore our back catalogue of content if you want to learn more about money and life.